This is monumental. Welcome to episode 100 of the Clarity Compressed Podcast. My name is Paul J. Daly. I am still your host. And we're going to insert some really triumphant thematic music right here. And roll the intro. Clarity can only really exist in the light of truth. Branding just isn't a tactic. It's a lifestyle change. I can't believe we've made it to 100. That means we've made a podcast every single week for the last 100 weeks. And it's been a lot of stinking work, but it's been worth it. And the reason I'm still making podcasts is really owed to you for listening, for watching, for interacting with all the social media, for buying the books, for coming to see me speak, for giving me feedback, for contributing, for innovating, for being guests on the show, for interacting, for growing together, pursuing clarity together. That is the reason I keep going forward. That is the fuel in the tank. It's the oxygen. And I can't thank you enough for helping this community get to episode 100. And that is how I see it. I see it as a whole community of people moving forward. Yes, maybe I'm producing the content, but you are participating in the content and hopefully we all grow together. This week for episode 100, I knew I wanted to do something different. So we are doing something different. And the different thing is I wanted to go back over the last 100 episodes and pick out some monumental moments of most of these are guest interviews. And so that you can go back and and we can hear some of the wisdom that's come across the table from these people and reminisce a little bit, but refresh our minds on the things that we think are important and things that will help us grow, because that's how it often is in life. You learn a lot. We learn a lot. We consume a lot of content. If you're motivated, you're reading books and listening to podcasts and having mentors. And so you're constantly learning a, a lot of beneficial things, a lot of good points, um, a lot of little nuggets of wisdom. And what happens is over time, you forget them, you move on to something else, but it's not always because it, it was good to move on from something else. You just, this constant deluge of information means that you just keep moving. So I think it's great to go back and remember some of the things that were really profound and really important so that we can kind of sew them back in to the regular fabric of life. So really what we're going to do is we're going to watch a clip or listen to a clip if you're just listening. And then uh, I'm going to talk about where that came from. And I don't know, most of you may not even know this story, but this podcast began way back to the beginning, 100 weeks ago, began because I believe that creating content to spread ideas was the way I needed to invest my time and resources. And I read a book called Like I See It by a guy named Dale Pollack. And many of you in the auto industry especially especially know who he is. And the book made an impact on me because it was calling the automotive business to be better. It was calling out problems. It was calling out customer demands and what the culture is telling us about what people wanted. And I thought it was so profound and made such an impact that I uh, commissioned my team to make a whole content series around it. And I scripted this content out and we shot it. And we were just going to release it as a video series to give to our current customers uh, with the reconditioning company that I had started and was owned at the time, Image Auto. And I just wanted my dealers to be the best dealers and the sharpest dealers because if they were the best dealers, not even in the area that I helped solve, we were a reconditioning company, meaning that um, we helped them fix cosmetic blemishes in their on their cars, so scuffs and scrapes on wheels and whatnot. But I knew that I needed to help my customers be better businesses and be more better or be better at marketing and be better at inventory and all the things that it takes to make an automotive business successful. Because I believed if my customer was ultimately successful, then the little part that I played would actually become, um, the little part that I played would also succeed. If they sold more cars, I'd have more cars to recondition. And if I could offer high value service at a competitive price, and I was also the person that helped them be an overall better business, why wouldn't they choose Image Auto or Rim Doctor to do their reconditioning work? So it was a long play. It was a deep play. And the content series that we made, I thought, you know what? This should turn into a podcast. We should just release the audio as a podcast. And we did. And we got such a good response from that. 
we said, let's keep going. Thus, the Clarity Compressed podcast was born. Originally, it was actually called the Dealers Compressed podcast. Fun fact. So this week, we're going back. That's how it started. And we're going to wrap everything up with a clip from Dale to kind of put a period on the end of this podcast. But before that, we're going to go through a bunch of clips from people um, that I respect a lot. And there are going to be names that you recognize, Gary Vaynerchuk and Guy Kawasaki and Ernie Garcia, the CEO of Carvana. We have a lot of great guests coming up. So if you have only been following for a little bit, or even if you've been following for a long time, it's going to be fun to, to reintroduce to some old friends and some great concepts that are really timeless. So let's get into the first clip. Here it is. Actually, maybe I'll introduce who I'm going to talk to first. So, um, Okay, so the first clip is from someone that I met online, and he is his name is Matt Weinberg. And this conversation, he ha he runs a company called Modell. Um, they help auto dealers sell cars digitally online. Very innovative, West Coast, San Francisco company. And the conversation with Matt, one of the funniest moments, I still refer to it to this day, still one of my favorite moments from the podcast, is when we talk about what people think, mindset, toward auto dealers. So here it is, a little snippet from my conversation with Matt Weinberg. First thing that we would do when we would do internet sales process training is we'd sit down with the GM or dealer principal and I'd say, Paul, so you just had somebody go on your website. They said, I want a price on a Honda Accord. They literally wrote in, I want a price on the Honda Accord. And I'd say, Paul, how do you want to handle this? And nine times out of 10, that GM or dealer principal would say, well, I want to call him and bring him in. Yeah, get him in, get him in. Right, just, just get him in here and then we'll handle it. And I would say, okay, pause for a second. Can you give me one word to describe how customers feel about car dealers? This is if it. you could only use one word, what would that be? And I do this again today, but back then they would say things like, and they say the same things today, untrustworthy, sleazy, slimy, things like that. Here My favorite answer, one. by the way, that I ever received was suspect. There it is. <laughs> and I, I love that <laughs> answer because I don't think that the, that the consumer automatically Just assumes you that it. you're untrustworthy, suspect. slimy, or sleazy, but they suspect you might be because you're a car dealer. But no matter, no matter what they shared with me, we would kind of – you know, do word association until either they said the word fear or eventually I would say, look, all of those things lead to a visceral emotional response of fear. 100%. Because they suspect that you might be sleazy, slimy, untrustworthy, they are afraid. Right. They have fear. So when they come to your website and they're thinking, okay, car dealer can't trust them, but you know what? I need a car. And they submit a lead back then for a price on a Honda Accord. And your response is to call them and say, hey, don't worry about price. We've never lost a car deal on price. When can you get in here? There you go. Did you alleviate their fear or exacerbate it? Oh, my Did you gosh. get I love that clip. I especially love the way he said suspect. I, I talk about it all the time. If you know Matt, it's like quintessential Matt. The point of that clip is that it's very easy to ignore what the customer data and the customer response is telling you because you have in your mind what you really are or how they should or how you want them to react and respond to you. The automotive industry has done this and we're really, now I see massive shifts since I recorded this. It's almost been two years now. And in the last two years, I've watched the industry respond to this and I think we're only at the beginning. We're only at the beginning of um, the early adoption curve where now it's starting to gain momentum. But back then, two years ago, it was very, very new and fresh. The customer, when they tell you something, you have to listen. You can't think that, well, you know better than how they feel. No, your brand, your product is a feeling. And if you ignore that feeling, well, then you're ignoring what your customer wants and the whole thing breaks down, becomes more contentious, more expensive, slower moving, and in the end, every single person loses. So 
I love that first clip from Matt. I'm glad we we started off and kicked off with that because boy, it's one of my favorites. And the principle is applicable across any industry, anywhere, anytime, in any time period, 2020 and beyond. It's my friend Matt Weinberg. All right, next clip. Oh my gosh, this next clip, as I'm looking at the list, this guy needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him an introduction anyway. Um, many or most or maybe all of you listening to this podcast have either had some level of interaction or understanding or knowledge, seen some content from the one and only Gary V. It's Gary Vaynerchuk, someone that when I recorded this podcast or when I recorded this interview, um, I was all nervous first time I ever met him. I just kind of guilted him into doing a quick interview. In the two years since, I've built a relationship with him and his organization, Vayner. I've been there many times, worked together in closed room situations many times um, as a Vayner mentor client. Uh, he's helped me start the agency. His team has always been there for me. But this conversation with Gary is so near and dear to my heart. I embodied this principle way before he said this. A lot of other people in the industry uh, will talk about this principle, but really a foundational principle of leadership and accountability Here's the one and only Gary V. What CEOs and business owners have done a good job with, especially in big companies, is somehow manipulate the conversation that it's not their fault. Like whose fault is it? Like it's his fault. It's his fault. It's my fault. Like if you're in charge of your shit, it's your fault. So no, I don't see a difference between people and organizations because the organization is following the lead of the singular decision maker. And I think the reason I've also done well in business is I go into industries that I know nothing about because I go into them. When I talked earlier about opening a car dealership and hurting people, I mean it because I wouldn't know anything. I wouldn't know margin, I wouldn't know location, I wouldn't know anything. But in a year, I would know everything from a different perspective and in that new vision, I would have advantages over the market doing it the same way. I would know they would do it the same way and then I would exploit what they were doing with my new shit and that's why I tend to win. So reinvention, is that just a way of life? Yeah, it's the cost of entry of being successful at all times. There you have it. As you probably expected, no holds barred, in your face answer. When I was interviewing Gary, talking about executives and leadership, company leadership, there there is a response from somebody who has absolutely owned it over the last two years, over the last five, 10, I mean, all of his life. But taking responsibility as a leader And at the end of the day, being willing to say it's my fault, not blaming you, not blaming you, not blaming the market, not blaming the other person, not blaming a conflict that's going on, not blaming who's in the Oval Office. It's my, I'm sorry for the, no, let's rocking. Get out of here. Not blaming people. He says that's why he's been ex- 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 why he's been successful in business is because he understands that. It's really a principle that I try to embody and I want to grow in. I'm not always there. But the second you start to blame something else, if you think about it, you're letting go of control of the result. You're letting go of accountability. And the bottom line, accountability in business is about ownership, span of control. And when you ignore that, And when you want to pass the blame and when you want to figure out a way that it isn't your fault, well, then that's the very first step on a long road that you don't want to go on where things are out of your control and you're just a victim to what's going on around you. I mean, look, Gary will always give it to you straight. He gave it to us straight there. And I like at the end that reinvention is the cost of doing business at all times. And I think that that is never an old concept. It's never going out of style. Again, something that will never, ever, ever be untrue. Reinvention, innovation. You want to grow? You want to grow a business in this climate? Well, you have to be committed, committed to innovation. You know how I say innovation is a choice? It's a choice. You can be accountable to it, for it, all the time, every time. And it's the cost of doing business at all times. So really great to see Gary jumping in at the number two spot. Um, I think this might be chronological. No, it's not. I don't know. It's not. All right. Next guest. That didn't suck. 
That didn't suck. That didn't suck. Okay, I'm not going to sing the whole song, but if you know what I'm talking about, if you've seen that commercial, this conversation is one that I had with the CEO of the publicly traded company Carvana, major disruptor in the automotive space, major disruptor kind of in the technology space too. Um, this conversation I had with Ernie about, I mean, it was over this past year, so it's kind of modern, very current. And uh, we talk a little bit about owning the customer distrust that we spoke about in the first clip. And basically, from a real entrepreneurial, customer-focused approach to it, we get to hear from Ernie on why they do it, how they do it. And I just think it's always insightful to listen to people who are doing big things, love them or hate them. They're not profitable yet. Everybody wants to throw stones at that. But what they do right and what they are crushing is listening, listening to what the customer is saying and taking accountability and responsible responsibility for it. So here's a little snip from my conversation with Ernie Garcia, CEO of Carvana. we have to kind of acknowledge it, right? Like in order to move through it and move forward and, and build the company we want to build, we have to acknowledge it. And yeah. we don't mean any ill will at all towards dealers, but it's, but we got to communicate to consumers and, you know, they have a view and, and we feel like we understand that view. And so we're going to speak to them. And then once we're speaking to them, I think maybe that, that makes things a little bit uncomfortable, but yeah, yeah. I, I think it kind of is what it is. Yeah. I, th I think don't kill the messenger. I mean, I personally think that you've done the industry a huge favor by being willing to put it out there because it exhibits like we talk about it in marketing today, right? The person with the most empathy and the one that produces to that empathy is going to get the attention. And I think that you've executed on that super well. And, and I am starting to see in the industry the tide turn toward dealers who are willing to acknowledge the pain and the stereotypes, which are actually that way because they're true and all the resentment that's been built up. So, um, uh, that that's my my position on what you've been doing. So, and I think it's good for people to hear your personal position on it, and kind of clear that up. I mean, it's you're still a business, right? So, feature advantage benefit, like the feature of Carvana, is like we understand what you want, and we're going to give it to you. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that that's all we're trying to do. So, and I think that that can probably be perceived uh, negatively by some, but I, I hope at the end of the day they can respect that you know we're, we're doing what what makes sense for us, and we're we're simply communicating on the terms that the consumers already feel. Well, at the end of the day, we're all doing business with people and humans, and Ernie has faced a lot of fire from the auto industry. My perspective is that he's done something which is. Some of the essence, the, the foundation of it is very simple. He's listened to what customers are saying and he's empathized with it and he's basically given it back to them. And that's why they've connected. Oh, you don't trust dealers? They're suspect. You don't like going to the dealership? Well, guess what? We understand that. So we're not a dealership, but we do sell cars. And uh, that interview has so many more insights, but we couldn't obviously play them all. Um, this could be a three-hour episode if we just wanted to go that way. So it's not about whether or not our business or industry has changed. It's about whether or not the customer has changed and the customer's always changing. And when that happens, we need to listen, we need to respond, and we need to give them what they want accordingly. And I think Ernie's a great example of someone who's working really hard to innovate and do that. So that's Ernie Garcia. Next up, oh, this is a good one. Um, they're all good. But this next one is uh, from someone that I've interviewed actually a couple of times. She was the very, 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 very first person I've ever done an interview with. This isn't that clip, um, but she gave me time when no one knew the podcast. I had zero guests and she gave me some time. This is Dr. Nicole Lipkin. Um, She's from, she lives and works, has a practice in Philly. What I really like about her perspective is that she understands the human psyche from a therapy standpoint, from a how it works on multiple fronts, but then she also has an MBA and she pairs that with the business world. So she gives some real rational approaches to why people might act and behave within an organization the way they do. And um, 
talk, uh, in this clip, we're going to talk about mental agility and her take on mental agility and why it's so important for anyone in business or marketing today. And I know you're going to get some more out of this clip if you've forgotten it or if you haven't heard it before from Dr. Nicole Lipkin. Fun. You know, so I like fun. that. Love it. That combination is great, I think, because people that just go into the business world and organizational psych, they don't have the advantage of really getting their minds around like the root issues. Like yeah. you see them play out in a business, yeah. but the closer you get to it, you realize like these are like the same issues. They're just manifesting in this organizational yeah. way. The bottom line is like until we're all robots, until the robots take over, it's humans that we're working with. And so therefore you need to understand human behavior. And you probably have the most is. job security. You probably have more job security than anybody in the planet because people are always going to be messed up and they're always going to try to understand why I do what I do. Right. Hopefully so the people are trying to understand what they do, what they, why they do what they do. Hopefully. That's, well, that's really the, important, but not everyone has it. Good point. How would you, even, let's start by you defining, what do you define as mental agility? Yeah, so I define it a little bit differently than kind of what you would, if you, if you, if you looked it up, how it's defined, like keeping our brains agile, like as we mm -hmm. age. So the way mm -hmm. I define it is working with your own mindset and working with how you approach people and the world and the environment to be as open as possible, to be as mm -hmm. flexible mentally as possible. Because mm -hmm. the bottom line, when you think about, when you think about our world right now, like you think about wars or, or, or politics or religion or everything, everything stems from the inability to be agile, to be so stuck in your ways and biased with your own point of view that you right. can't see another person's point of view. You're and that, rigid, right? You're the rigid. opposite would be rigidity, right? Right. And that yeah. makes us, that that creates fights, it creates arguments, it creates my way or the highway kind of thinking, which immediately causes this with other people. So okay. it's kind of the art and science of keeping our brains and our minds open and flexible to see other ways so we can shift and move and be agile and be quick. Mm -hmm. So one thing that we got into that conversation was in that clip, she talked about politics and she said she's found that a great test on how mentally agile you are, which she describes as being able to listen to opposing views without letting your emotions take over, take the wheel. She said, can I listen to the other side of where I stand on the political argument and actually listen. And she points out that that skill is really the essence of mental agility, being able to take it in and make your thinking flexible, not based on your emotions or your reactions, but based on your rational thinking. Oh man, there's so much more uh, in the interview with her. I wish we could show you more. Please go back and check it out. Um, we'll post the episode of, of what it is. But at the end, you can't just react because you feel like you're supposed to or your emotions are taking the wheel. And how often in business and life do our emotions or predetermined mental models that we build of people and situations, just really the habit of how we respond to that just runs off with the whole situation? How often does that happen? You know, in an ideal world for me, that would never happen. It's not the case. I'm working on it. Work on it with me, will you? So there you go, Dr. Nicole Lipkin. Um, okay, this next one uh, is a more recent one. And uh, it's with a guy named Guy Kawasaki. And if you don't know who Guy is, he was one of the original employees at Apple. He actually worked directly for Steve Jobs uh, several times in his career. And uh, he helped brand early Macintosh and uh, some early Apple products. He started a company called Canva, which a lot of you creatives know. He's a Mercedes-Benz brand ambassador, and uh, he's got a new podcast called Remarkable People, which is pretty amazing, and uh, was able to catch up with him. We spoke at the same event, and so we grabbed a few minutes and uh, had a little podcast interview and talked about brand and had some really funny moments in it. But uh, here's just one clip from that interview with Guy Kawasaki. So what is... What is your perspective of a brand evangelist and what, what that should mean? For me, um, you know, first of all, I think a lot of people are trying to create a personal brand. Mm -hmm. This is great. I think that's total bullshit. Why? That, well, when you 
get it in your mind that you want to create a personal brand, it means you're going down the path of like narcissism. And I, I don't, I don't know Elon Musk, but I, you know, I sort of knew Steve Jobs. I don't know if I was in his inner circle, but I don't think that Elon Musk or Steve Jobs ever, ever sits down and said, how do I make the Steve Jobs brand? Right. You know, I refuse to believe that conversation. He was just Steve Jobs Yeah, he was every just day. Steve Jobs, and his brand was his brand. Mm -hmm. And so these people who say, ah, I'm going to work on my personal brand. I'm going to make myself a thought leader, a guru, you know, that I'm going to write a book to position myself. I'm going to make speech, you know, all that. See my it's all total, what? Did I say the wrong thing? <laughs> no, no, I'm just laughing because everyone that knows this podcast oh. knows that I'm building a personal brand, oh. and I just wrote a book. Okay, well, no, I, I appreciate shit, then. No, um, <laughs> no you're not. You're I'm not. Saying, I appreciate the conversation. <laughs> I'm saying saying that you know personal brand is a result of what you do in your real job it's you, who you really are yes as opposed to this is the thing i'm going to manufacture so i i can tell you i don't really spend a lot of time thinking about my personal brand i just am what i am yep you may not like what I stand for, but mm -hmm. it's not because I'm crafting like, oh, you know, I'm going to position. It's good for the brand. Is this slightly, bad for yeah. me? No, I, I agree with that. And no, that mean, doesn't mean that I, I say, okay, you know, I'm just going to be a bad guy, right? I'm, but, cog I'm cognizant of the example that I set for my kids and for, you know, God knows who might be influenced by what mm -hmm. I do. Legacy. But I'm not thinking, oh, I'm going to position myself as a thought leader. So that was a super funny moment. The, the moment he said that about personal brand and really the, the basic principle of it, and I agree with him 100%, that building a personal brand and being the person that you want people to think you are, not the person that you really are, is really dangerous territory because he's right. It does go down the path of narcissism and it's not like building a company where you kind of are this own this PR version of the company and a product because that's not an actual person. But when you are a person and you start to manipulate your thinking about who you actually are, that's a real dangerous place to be. And so, you know, through this podcast and my content, I talk about being the same person. And that's, I want people to know that Paul is the same person, whether I meet him in the room um, whether I'm at home with my family, whether I'm in front of the camera or talking to you on a podcast, it's just who I am. Now, granted, there's a little showmanship and, you know, a little flair that we try to put in and have fun. But at the same time, this is who I am. And I think if you're building a personal brand, trying to be someone you're not, right? He said, like developing, positioning yourself as a thought leader, that does get into dangerous territory. And let's face it, most people know that you're a fraud or they call out the fraud in it pretty quickly. We're really good at deciphering that these days. I always say, if you have the words thought leader in your bio or in your LinkedIn profile or description, we all really know you're not a thought leader. We just know it. Why? Because you have to tell me you are, then just inherently you're not. Because you're selling me on the fact that you're a thought leader. Be a thought leader. Don't tell everybody you're a thought leader. It has the opposite effect. So, I wanted to include that clip because it's hilarious. And and when he said that, I wanted to lean all into it because I know enough about him to know what he meant. And he had an opportunity to clarify himself. All right, moving on. This next clip is uh, from probably one of the most shared and responded to episodes of the podcast that we did. And it's a recent one where I talked about a principle called the transaction of growth. And this is a context in which I put... Um, that growth actually costs something and going through many, many transitions of growth over the last, um, you know, 16, 17 years in business, I begin to lean into it a little bit more and identify it. And once you can identify where you are, it's a lot easier to push through to the other side. So here's a clip on the transaction of growth. Growth is a transaction. Growth costs something. How many people say they want to grow, but they don't do the work or have the ability to count the cost of what it will take to get there? Now I know I'm getting some more of your attention because anything in your life, anything in your business, anything in a personal relationship, 
that has experienced growth in a good way? Well, there was a transaction and it actually costs something. It really is one of the most fundamental things in humanity. Like even when we're a, a, a young child, a toddler, we learn to walk through falling, bumps and bruises, the transaction of growth. In business, it's the whole principle of investment. You have to invest before you can see a return on that investment. This building is, an, is really an example of that. You know, speaking today, going back seven or eight years to the image auto world and kind of looking at the position that uh, the my agency congruent is in right now, very similar. Um, we're growing. We grew a lot over the last year. The team is growing. We're very, very compressed in the space we're in, which is why I'm willing to make the investment and take the risk to get into an amazing space because I understand the growth we're experiencing and the growth that is right around the corner. Well, it's going to be a transaction and it's going to cost something. People, the team, the people who give their time and energy to congruent, I understand and I say it all the time. They have other opportunities. There are always opportunities for talented people, but they choose to invest their time, their talents, and their energy here in this time with me. So you think that's going to cost something? Yes. So I think that's something that applies to everyone across the board in every area of your life, your home, family, your internal thinking, obviously your business, your organization, progress that you want to make. It really helps when you know you're in the middle of the struggle. Can you imagine like running like a, a marathon or even running a few miles and not having any idea how close to the finish line you are? That would be torture. So just like a map, if you have a map and you see where you want to go, but you don't know where you are, the you are here circle isn't there, then it's really frustrating and demoralizing. Maybe not demoralizing. That's not the right word. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Or discouraging is probably a better word. And so the transaction of growth, when you're in the midst of the pain and the struggle and the tension to realize that you are actually on your way to the thing you want to be, to the place you want to go, realizing that truth is like that's part of the progress is actually really encouraging because a lot of times when there's pain and there's tension and there's struggle, we feel like we're going to die, literally, metaphorically. So I think that's why transaction of growth uh, really resonates at large because it's something we all go through. So really wanted to share that clip with you. The next clip uh, is a clip from the first event that we ever held, and that was in May of 2019, so this past year. And we held an event in Rochester. We brought in some great speakers. They all were so cool enough to fly in and do it because they believed in the message and they believed in what we were doing. It was called Clarity Con. And uh, this is a, a little clip from that. The theme of the event was alignment. And I know a lot of... Uh, conferences have like a, a very linear, a linear trajectory, you know, on one topic, marketing or operations. And I wanted to have an event that helped the whole team focus on alignment because you could have the best components of marketing or operations or finance. But if all of those aren't aligned, guess what? The whole thing falls apart. So here's a little clip from Clarity Clown, uh, very intro, the opening keynote where I talked about alignment. Only find it. That took a second. And that's why alignment is what I had in mind when I created this event and the thought and the idea for this event. Because what good is sales if service drops the ball? What good is service if sales can't move used cars? What happens out of alignment? What happens if your people strategy doesn't line up with the needs you have Come on, to internet. fill the seats on the bus? So inherently, so inherently today, we're here for today for alignment.
Look, it doesn't matter what you're doing. The illustration I gave in that talk was you could have a car that has a fast engine and a dialed in transmission, great tires, but if they don't all work in sync, then the car's gonna spin out and crash. So it doesn't matter. If you don't have alignment, alignment is the ultimate KPI. A business could have great assets, but if they're not aligned, guess what? It doesn't even matter. What a waste. I know you've seen, you've known people in your life that have amazing amounts of talent, but they can't keep their life on the rails practically. And what do we say? What a waste. What a waste. So alignment uh, was the main trajectory of that event. It's going to be a growing trajectory within uh, this next year, 2020, for me, this content uh, in my company. And I hope that you get a little bit from that, encourages you a little bit uh, to focus on alignment, because if you don't, guess what? It doesn't even matter. All right, next clip. Oh, man, next clip. One of my favorite people, one of my very favorite people, Claude Silver, the chief heart officer at VaynerMedia. Claude, she's a very special person. Talk about someone who is in touch with uh, the human needs and how to bring those together. And not only to, you know, she's kind of a champion of like, look, when you're at work, it's not just your professional life. It's the whole person at work. So the whole person needs to be encouraged. The whole person needs to be uh, grown and developed. And when that happens, well, the professional output is better too, but the holistic output and the legacy of the impact you made on somebody's life is better as well. So uh, here's where Claude and I have a conversation in her office at Hudson Yards in New York City talking about you just have to care about people first. Like, what are some things that you would coach every leader that's watching this, every business owner, like to just a little mind shift or a little deploying thing that they can yeah, do? Yeah, can I curse on this podcast? You can. Here we, we go. can always bleep it out if it doesn't work. Can, can give a shit about people. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, no matter if you are talking to car dealers, you are talking to dentists, you are talking to marketers. Like for real, not like fake because I'm supposed to. Yeah, like... Hey, how are you doing? Yeah. How is your aunt? She's in the hospital. I heard your cat died. Dude, I heard your son got engaged. How's that? Thing is, is we, 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 all of us, every single one of us, we cut off half of ourselves when we walk into work and pretend that we don't have this other life. Why do you think that? I think that we were, I think back in the dark ages and maybe the 50s, <laughs> uh, 40s, I, you know, I wasn't around. So, um, uh, we were we were separating work and life, mm -hmm. and uh, there were roles that helped us separate work. I'm so and glad life. that's being. Broken dad down. went off to work. Mom stayed home mm -hmm. in the kitchen, and Dad went off to work and closed off the fact that he had this other life. Maybe he had a photo of mom and kids on the desk, but we segregated and separated mm -hmm. ourselves. Yeah, and I I also think that carried its way into the world of HR. Mm -hmm. By the way, which. I'm in and, and needs a complete rebranding mm -hmm. because we are in the business of people. And that means I need, it's my responsibility, and as a business owner, it's your responsibility, and it's as, as a coworker, it's your responsibility to care about other people and the culture that you are working in. All right, we're gonna have to move on. Time constraints. So as you can see, Claude and I uh, really see eye to eye on a lot of things. And I think you can, from that even that little clip, you can tell why I like her so much is because those things are the things that I care about most in my business, and that's the people. And fortunately, I live in a day and age, and you live in a day and age, when you can make people the very center of your efforts, and you can use that to make a business thrive or an organization thrive, or even your family thrive. So i uh, Always happy to introduce more people to Claude Silver. I hope that more people find out about her through this little snippet. Back in, go watch the whole episode. Go check out Claude's stuff. Uh, it's really just a, a daily drip feed of more of what you just saw. Uh, moving on, probably one of the un most unique individuals we've had on the show is Jesse Cole, the owner and CEO of the Savannah Bananas minor league baseball team, who, let me just say, when you go to this place, it's an experience. This, these games are sold out in an industry where these games don't sell out like weeks, months in advance. And uh, it's because he pays attention to what people actually want. He's an expert on customer experience, understanding what people want, what they don't like, 
and doing the things that they want and not doing the things that they don't like on a very consistent basis and unapologetically. So here's the very engaging, entertaining, and kind Jesse Cole. You have to start looking at what are those things that you can do that don't frustrate your customers. Because if you're doing things that are frustrating your customers, they're upset. They're yelling at you and you're not having yep, fun. And yes, he wears a yellow tuxedo. So I worked with a car dealership up in uh, Toledo, Ohio, and we talked about Stop the Hate. He, they formed a Stop the Hate campaign. They had all of their people sent out to their uh, family and said, what are the things that you hate about a car dealership? And they had tons of lists. And they said, all right, what are those things that we can eliminate right now to make a better experience for our customers? It's a bigger picture. And so once they started eliminating that, they had less frustrated customers. People are coming in happier. And so you got to start from the beginning and look at, well, obviously, they don't like all these ads thrown in their face. They don't like car pe- people rushing out to them. What would be the perfect experience for you? And it, it's a big picture, but we start with that. And then, then again, make it fun. They have cornhole sets now in their in their dealerships. They make it fun for their people to actually have a good time. And that is really the essence of why his business has been able to grow. He's been able to create experiences that people love and they tell other people around him before you know it, everybody wants to be a part of it. If you can do it in minor league baseball team, like what he says, like, hey, we decided we're going to have a circus and maybe a baseball game will break out. So he's got break dancing first base coaches, like literally they had to teach him how to be a first base coach because they hired him because he knew how to dance. It's crazy. Check him out on social media. Uh, the yellow tux guy, Savannah Bananas, Jesse Cole. Uh, I'm going to go down to a game with my family this summer. I cannot wait. And I'm glad you were able to meet him here on the podcast. All right. Rounding the corner. Well, we've rounded the corner. This is the last leg. Um, so this year, hold on. Let me find the clip. So this year I released my very first book and it came out of uh, a desire to share this message that marketing is a very human thing. And especially in the automotive industry, I wanted to attract and get the word out and rally around the dealers around the country, which I think is probably about 5% of the dealers in this country that believe and are willing to move their businesses in a human direction, meaning that we're not in the car business. And whatever you sell, whatever industry you're in, you're not in that business. You're in the business of motivating people to work toward a good end. You're in the business of connecting with the needs of your customers. You're in the connection business. You're in the great place to work business. It's it's simple, but it's not easy because it's easy to say, well, I sell this widget. I'm in the widget business. No, that is the output of the business you're really in. So this, in this clip, I give a little excerpt from the book called The Automotive Manifesto. And uh, if you want more about the book, you can go back to this episode or you can check it out. We'll link it up. But here's uh, an episode where I kind of talk about this. This kind of brings my thinking full circle um, in marketing this year. And this comes from chapter two. The chapter's titled, You Must Connect. It says, connection has always existed. It is a primal component of humanity, primarily for physical safety and survival. Now, In addition to these baseline needs, our modern society allows us to connect in much deeper and more frequent ways. Human connection now occurs on every level, from important things like new babies, down to the most superficial of things like your friend's weekend outing, your team's latest free agent signing, or that funny noise your dog makes when it sleeps. Either way, social media has made it possible to generate countless touch points, all of which determine our level of connection and affinity, or lack thereof, to the world around us. You must connect, but what does that really mean? It's all about connection. It's all about connection, which is why my agency, Congruent, I say we're a connection agency. We're not a creative agency. We're not a marketing agency. We help people connect because when people are connected, when they're connected, like really connected, let's face it, life is better. It's more meaningful. It's more motivating. You feel more, you feel safer when you're connected. So imagine being able to take your business or your organization or your family and say, we feel connected. Man, that is powerful because it's what really is woven into the the humanity of every one of us. 
craving and desiring being connected to others. So yeah, it's a book that's called The Automotive Manifesto, but it really is about connection. And that really is the center point of what I, I'm trying to do with everything I do. And now we're going to show you one last clip and really appropriately coming full circle now. This is a clip from Dale Pollack, the innovator, the man who wrote the book that kicked off this whole podcast a hundred weeks ago. And Dale is talking about, and so like Dale is, has a, built a technology company. He really changed the way people buy and sell cars. Fundamentally, you may not understand how and why if you're not in the car business, but it affects you. Every, every person that buys a car is affected by this man and uh, probably paid a lower price because of this man, honestly. But Dale brings some great wisdom and perspective, and it's a little countercultural when he says chasing happiness um, isn't the most important thing. And I'm going to let him say it, but I think, um, yeah, it's better coming from him. But I think we need to pay attention because this is a man who has the perspective of experience and has been ups and downs and tried a lot of things. And so uh, let's hear from who has become a good friend of mine, the one and only Dale Pollack. I'm going to ask you one more question. Um, I kind of tend to be legacy-minded uh, just in general. And um, what do you want your legacy in the auto industry to be? When you when you hang up, you know, the V-Auto spurs and you decide, okay, I'm out or whenever, whenever that time comes, what do you want the industry to remember you as? I owe everything that I have to uh, the dealership model. My father was a car dealer. It provided me an excellent upbringing. It gave me all of the professional opportunity that I ever would have hoped for. And I have a place in my heart and always will for the viability of the dealership and particularly the family-owned dealership. Mm -hmm. um, I really have uh, a sense of, of family uh, when I look into many of these dealerships and I understand the hardships, I understand the struggles, I understand the privilege of uh, having a family-owned dealership. And uh, I also respect uh, how much dealerships mean to their communities and to the families of the people who work in those dealerships. So I would like my legacy to be one that is recognized as helping dealerships survive and thrive in a very challenged environment. So there you have it. Look for meaning. Look for legacy. Happiness follows that. Happiness is temporary. I get happy when my number gets called at Shake Shack because I'm hungry. That makes me happy. It doesn't give me any meaning. Sometimes things that give me meaning, actually, think about it, make me cry and bring sadness. Oh, whoa, my gosh, what? You're sad. You can't be sad. You're supposed to be happy. And if you're not happy, that means you're not doing anything meaningful. No. Joy and meaning and legacy often come at the expense of your happiness, especially temporary happiness, right? Anyone kids ever drive them nuts? Anyone kid, anyone's kids ever do something that hurts? I think the strongest relationships go through pain and that's why they get stronger. And the bond gets stronger and brings you value and meaning in life. You ask any military vet, what is the meaning that they have what is the level of value and legacy they feel like they leave after they've gone through some really terrible situations? Are those happy situations? Combat situations? Are those happy situations? No. But they brought meaning. Meaning that no one else can take away. So this year, I hope to really flip the script on happiness a little bit. Um, I hear it a lot. I want to talk about legacy. I want to talk about pursuing meaning more than pursuing happiness. I hope to do that through another hundred episodes of this very show. I can't thank you enough for being part of this over the last hundred episodes. The reason I keep doing this is because people keep watching and listening and connecting. And it brings me meaning to know that we collectively are moving forward and finding meaning. I'm just one guy with some ideas. I don't even think that like, there's any special thing in like, oh, these ideas are all come from me. No, these ideas come from really taking from a lot of other people's thinking 
And a lot of them are just gifts, right? You're born with what you're born with. And some people can run fast. And for me, sometimes I can put pieces together a different way that hopefully makes sense and connect with you so that you pursue more meaning, so that you do have more happiness, so you have better organizations and healthier families. And in the end, that's all a result of you pursuing clarity. Thanks so much. I will see you on episode 101.